Hi, everyone. My name is Thaddeus, as Holly introduced me. Thank you, Holly. Um, I am here to dive a little bit deeper into some of the different things we were seeing. Um, I will admit here, though, I do want to start with because we were seeing some great questions there about uh, the musical instruments. Um, I will say I'm not a musician, so we will definitely get to those questions uh, in a little bit, just a little bit later. Uh, but I've got my own program uh, here. I'm going to be using a particular program called Digistar, uh, provided by Evans and Sutherland for our time here today. Uh, and where are we going to start with? Well, you know, I wanted to, as I was listening to the concert um, before this, I was listening to, to tonight here, uh, I was I was really looking for ways to connect to it. Um, music, of course, impacts all of our lives in different ways. And uh, even if I do not personally speak Italian, the translations and the music itself had its own impact as well. Um, of course, the first piece started off with the pestilence. Um, can't escape COVID, <laughs> even now we can't escape it. Um, but uh, there is a lot happening astronomically about that. Uh, as well. Um, those first observations made that, that to the time and the day in, thir in the 1300s, those observations that predicted, in a sense, the pestilence um, were of a conjunction between Jupiter and Saturn. Uh, these conjunctions were noticed throughout time um, in Europe and uh, in the Middle East and in South America and Central America to Mayans uh, across the entire world. Um, and in a sense, these were uh, well, conjunctions are, in fact, quite difficult to uh, calculate. It takes many years of observations. Uh, but with the five known planets at the time, uh, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, uh, as well as the moon, our moon, uh, astronomers were able to do that. Of course, along the way, astronomers made things a lot more difficult. Um, we went from the five known planets uh, to additional to a couple more, Uranus and Neptune discovered in the 18 and 1900s. Uh, and then we added even a few more. Uh, we discovered, in fact, in the early 1900s, we discovered the dwarf planet Pluto, uh, as well as in the last few decades, uh, four more dwarf planets, uh, Humea, Make, Maki, and Eris, uh, as well as recategorizing Ceres, the asteroid to a dwarf planet. Um, and then, of course, along the way, we also discovered millions of other objects, whether they be asteroids in the asteroid belt or Kuiper belt objects as well further out in the solar system. So conjunctions went then from just a few objects that you could chart uh, with, well, some difficulty, but you could do it uh, over enough time to something that happens on a regular basis, but is usually only visible with a very good telescope. The particular conjunction of 1345 here, we're going to take a quick look at. Um, I'm taking us over here. We're actually going to land on Earth. We're going to land down in northern Italy in Brescia, the home of our first known composer. Uh, today, a, well, still as well, still a beautiful area uh, to explore. Today, a little bit more built up, uh, as we'll see in this view here, a little more built up than it was uh, 700 years ago or so. Uh, and that is a lot nicer going back in time, looking back several hundred years, because without the light pollution that we have now, uh, a conjunction in 1345 would have been even easier to see. This particular conjunction occurred just two years before the sort of big start of the, of the plague, uh, the Black Death. Um, and unfortunately to people, to observers, then it would have just been a bright spot in the sky. Uh, they would have been able to see over years Jupiter and Saturn moving closer and closer together, joined as well by Mars a little bit further, a little bit further away in the sky, but still relatively near, near enough, at least in the sky, that uh, bad things were, were in store. Flash forward a few hundred years to the early 1600s, where uh, many of the other pieces were, were composed. Uh, we have Galileo's work, building on the work of Copernicus and many other astronomers beforehand, uh, where with an invention of a telescope, uh, although, well, I should say he did not invent it himself, but with the refinement of the telescope, Galileo was able to make better observations, noticing now that there were spots of light moving alongside Jupiter, which you record as these little, these asterisks we see here on, that, uh, on either side of that circle, which is Jupiter itself. Uh, and with these observations, 
placing Jupiter not as some distant, far away, unknown thing, uh, but as a planet in our solar system. Um, his work from that then going on with, again, the work of many others uh, to place the Earth uh, in orbit around the sun, as well as the other planets in orbit around the sun. And of course, if we go back just a few months ago, just seven months ago, some of you might have seen this. This is actually a view. If you had a telescope, this is something of a view you could have gotten of the great conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn uh, in December, December 20th. Uh, I was lucky enough to see it a day afterwards. It was cloudy on the 20th here uh, in, in St. Paul, for me at least. Um, but I was able to go out just a day later and it was still, still close enough together. That was a beautiful sight, uh, especially through a telescope. And now building on the work of all these previous astronomers, we have even better views. Uh, Ganymede, in fact, was just recently imaged by the Juno spacecraft. Uh, Juno built to study more of Jupiter itself, but was able to observe, uh, get this beautiful view of the largest moon in the solar system. Uh, Ganymede here, about 3000 miles across and a world that we now think well, I refer to it as a world because of how complex we now think it is, uh, not just some static moon, but where there might possibly be water underneath its surface, uh, which is, I think about as mind blowing as the change in position from the earth, uh, from the other planets going around the earth to the earth going around the sun, the idea of water and what that might mean at a moon around Jupiter is, uh, is world changing. Now, I mentioned there, I'm not a musician, but uh, science, whatever you might think of it, is not divorced from the humanities, the arts. And one thing that happens, that has happened throughout time, um, is astronomers will take data that they have and they will turn it into music. They will sonify it. Um, I'm going to share a short video, just a part of a video, actually, um, of the Huygens landing on Titan which was sonified by astronomers working on this data. It's, it's kind of faint, you might need to turn up your volume here and hopefully the sound is being shared. Uh, Zoom tells me it is. Now, our time, my time is limited, so I don't, I'm not going to play this entire thing, but these beeps and clicks that you are hearing there, these were uh, particular moments of that mission descending. When an image was taken, uh, what the airspeed, the velocity was, what the radio signal was like, um, scientists made their own music from that. Very different from what we just heard, uh, like a total 180, I think, uh, in terms of musical styles but uh, still something that happens these days and is a beautiful way to, to share scientific data in a new way, um, to take people who might not be able to see this data and still share it with them to allow them to experience it and allow them to study it as well. But I have taken us back to the earth here and taken us now actually going to go a little bit further away. Moving through the pieces tonight, um, we came to pieces about the moon. Uh, as well as one that struck me about the return of Ulysses. Um, and it takes us now here to 1972, to December 11th, 1972. Many of you watching um, might have, I hope many of you watching were around back then, and you might remember this decade, um, the 70s and the 60s beforehand. Admittedly, some of you might not remember the 60s, but that's okay. We'll go over a little bit of it right here. Of particular note were the Apollo landings. From 69 to 72, uh, we landed on the moon. Apollo 11 through 17, skipping, of course, 13 there. Um, but six different missions, 12 different people walked on the moon. And this was a momentous occasion. This was the culmination of decades of work just to for the moon mission, but also centuries and millennia of science to allow rockets to launch from the earth to rise from the ashes of Troy and head outwards 240,000 miles. And in fact, that, that line there, the ashes of Troy, that really struck me because 
the Apollo 11 astronauts, they went to the moon in 69, and it was just two years after the disastrous Apollo 1 fire, uh, where, uh, where three astronauts were killed. Uh, a tragedy that, that shocked NASA, the, anyone following the space program. Um, and this, then the successful mission was a tribute in itself to that. We did only go to the moon for a few years, um, although the missions are planned to go back now. The last mission was uh, in 72 on December 11th, landing on December 11th. Uh, and this was a, a notable mission in many ways, uh, beyond spending about a week on the moon, truly living on the moon, as the astronauts said. Uh, this was the first mission, the, the first and only Apollo mission to carry a classically trained scientist. Uh, Gene Cernan, a geologist, uh, the only, again, classically trained scientist to go to the moon, although not to say anything, not, not to put the other Apollo astronauts down in any way, they were all incredibly qualified PhDs in their own fields with extensive scientific training as well. Um, but this mission, uh, along with many other missions before it, um, gave, gave these, these astronauts a chance to really get a look both at this this beautiful desolation of the lunar landscape, uh, cratered, pockmarked, dry nothingness in a sense, but also a, a sense of incredible beauty as they looked around them and as they looked up above them. Some of the most striking images from the Apollo missions from any, all of space flight have been of where we've been and also where we came from. Our own beautiful earth was noted from Neil Armstrong as something that he could cover up with his thumb to every astronaut after him who marveled at this tiny pale blue dot. Many of you again might have still remember that from even, not even that, but from the very first image of Earthrise from the Apollo 8 astronauts to go, the astronauts, the first astronauts to go around the moon, uh, seeing our own blue planet there as just one tiny little speck in the cosmos and on it absolutely everyone except for you know, a few others at the moon itself. And that's been one of the beautiful things about astronomy over millennia from it being the very first science in many ways over thousands of years and first observations of the motions of planets and the moon in the sky to where the sun is. We've now gone from a period of the sky being filled with nothing to it being filled with endless, countless sources of light. And perhaps no other astronomer or instrument has allowed us to do that more than the Hubble Space Telescope. The Hubble Space Telescope has been in orbit for going on 30 years now, a little over 30 years, and it's provided some of the most astonishing views of the universe. It has in its time and orbit around the earth, it has absor absor ob observed, uh, it has absorbed quite a bit of attention, but it has observed the planets in our solar system that it can safely see, allowing us new glimpses on everything from Jupiter to Neptune, uh, allowed us to study things like those small objects, asteroids or Ky Kuiper belt objects. Uh, and has given us a look even further out from that. It studied those distant stars, stars that we might very well know if we go out stargazing, our constellations that we put together in the sky. Scorpius, in fact, visible almost in the center there of the screen as we continue flying away. But it is also in its own way then given new shape to these constellations. The work of the Hubble Space Telescope and every other instrument that has been used to observe the sky has shown the earth and the sun to be one star out of millions and our constellations themselves, unfortunately not stick figures in the sky, but more like a giant spiky ball, a firework in the galaxy. And indeed we've given a new shape to our own galaxy itself, gone from the center of the universe to just one group of stars, one cluster of stars, surrounded by other island universes, as Immanuel Kant called other galaxies, other nebulae in the sky. 
and not just a few galaxies. The universe has been opened up and discovered to be filled with tens of thousands of nearby galaxies, just a few tens of millions of light years away. And looking even further out and back in time, filled with billions and trillions of other galaxies. Every single point of light you see there, another galaxy mapped out by the Hubble and dozens of other telescopes around the Earth and in orbit as well. And I think that just about reaches the end of my time here. So I'll leave you with this view of distant galaxies and just a little bit of everything that we can see and take us back to our panelists and hopefully a lot of, a lot of questions. Thank you, Tad. Thank you. Well, I invite our audience to use the chat window to type in your questions. There have been lots of observations and comments and a lot of questions about instruments. Um, we'll give it just a second to see if there are any astronomical questions that we'll start with before we before we turn it over uh, to to Yana and our, our friends with, with Suspiri. I, I have a question though, Tad, that I think that was surprised me tonight that the, so at the time of some of the, the musical compositions, right? I just want to make sure I heard you correctly. We only knew of five planets. Yes, depending on what we, yeah, um, in a sense, it depends on what you, how you define what a planet is. Um, yes, we knew of Mercury and Venus, Mars, Jupiter and Saturn. So the naked eye or unaided eye planets um, of which you can see almost all of right now in the sky. Mercury and Mars and Venus are up in the early evening, Jupiter and Saturn shortly after midnight. Mercury in the very early morning, I believe right now. I want to double check on that, but Mercury should be up too right now. So, so you can see all of them yourselves. That's excellent. And then it was only with the advancement of sort of advanced optics and telescopes that we were able to, and it, over a course of another I have to do the math, 500, 600 years that we came to understand the, all of the planets that, and dwarf planets that we, that we know today. <laughs> yes, yes. And Galileo really, in a sense, sort of, I would say sparked that. I think he would be the first, as I sort of mentioned there, I, I think when we talk about the first planet truly discovered, I would say Galileo with Jupiter, really placing it as a, a truly separate object um, outside of the earth. Um, although not really changing the earth from its place not really recognize in a sense that the Earth is a planet until uh, even later on um, past Tycho and Kepler um, as a truly another object like the other planets. Excellent. Well, I'm going to I'm going to say, tell our audience, use that chat window for your questions. Um, I know there have been some comments, particularly for our viewers who are watching on their phones, that they've been a little bit frustrated the captions are on, um, that I believe if you're looking on your phone, and I think it depends if it's an Android or a um, an, an iPhone, but the quest that I think there's three dots in the upper right hand that you can click on, um, and you should be able to see some viewing options there that allow you to hide the captions. Otherwise, if you're on your computer, you can hide captions if you're not using them by just clicking on the live transcript button, the CC. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Yana to introduce her colleagues again and then sort of respond to the presentation from Tad, maybe starting with some questions there, and we'll encourage the audience to keep those questions going. I'll represent the voice of the audience um, and throw those in, but I'll, I'll turn it over to you now, Yana. All right, well, thank you. Thanks for that great presentation, Tad. That was really just mind blowing. And I love the music from the Titan landing, especially um, because it, it's actually kind of like, you know, what they were talking about back in the middle ages, so the, that there was music in the heavens. And if, you know, if you could, if you could actually hear it, you know, it would, we'd actually be able to make harmony out of it. And so that's kind of in a sense what's going on there, right? Yeah, yeah. And uh, I, I want to mention, I saw one comment, uh, E Ewan said it sounds like early synth music. I think that sounds about right. Um, but yeah, and I, there was just follow up to that sort of as well. Um, yeah, it was um, the music, the music of the spheres. I mean, that was that influenced um, uh, Tycho and Kepler um, in in trying to determine planetary orbits. Kepler in particular, um, trying to determine the ratio between planets uh, moving around the sun to try to give a sense of harmony to this. Um, 
to this all this stuff we we see out there. Yeah, I mean that's kind of like the fascinating thing about you know as we're putting this program together, looking at the connections between astronomy and music, and it goes so far back to like ancient Greece, and 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 they're looking at the solar system really as this very ordered place, you know that that music is following certain mathematical rules that are being discovered, you know, that pitch has particular relationships to ratios that are expressed mathematically, and that, you know, our solar system is also following certain mathematical principles. And they're trying to make everything really simple to like express this kind of simplicity of the universe and how everything is working. But of course, it turns out not to be that simple, right? <laughs> No, not at all. <laughs> not not at all. Um, that's yeah. Um, I mean, one of the yeah. I, I don't know any other way to say that, but it's never it's never simple. Um, even when we think about something like the orbit of the or the the a year on Earth, we know is generally three sixty five, but is three sixty five and a quarter, but is actually three sixty five point two four. Um, and then taking the orbit of the Moon is twenty nine days, but it's actually twenty nine and a half, but it's actually like twenty nine point seven eight something um it nothing ever ends up being very nice and simple yeah it's interesting because when you look back you know in music from from medieval through the renaissance eras you know they're really fascinated with this idea of sort of perfection sonic perfection that there's you hear a lot of perfect intervals like in the first piece that we did the the chant um bruce who's below me on my screen anyway uh where your hand bruce playing the organ it was playing a fourth playing a fourth below me right yeah and and this was a common practice in the middle ages that you would have a melodic line and then you would follow it with a you know a fourth underneath and because these intervals were seen as very perfect intervals so it was pure music and and even into the renaissance there's this idea of like musical harmonies have to follow really specific rules and and this expresses a kind of spiritual perfection um, and then all of that really gets blown apart when we get to the 17th century, which is kind of the same as what's happening in astronomy, right? That suddenly, you know, where music is becoming much more dissonant, where, um, you know, we're, we're trying to find more asymmetries and, and find music that is going to express the experience of people more than some sort of abstract perfection. Similarly, like the, in astronomy, you have people like Galileo is looking at the heavens and saying, you know, look, we're actually observing this. And it's, it's a lot more complicated. Orbits aren't circular. They're actually elliptical. Like that's a big, big revolution, right? Yeah, that may be one of the biggest ones. I mean, to, for, for Kepler's stuff to work, his law is a planetary motion. It has to go from a nice, perfect circle to, to stretched out. Um, but even Galileo's work before that, um, the sun is the perfect unchanging sphere. The um, when then he observed sunspots, these blemishes on the sun, which you don't want God to have acne, so that's kind of a problem. And I realize I probably just insulted a handful of people, and I do apologize for that. Um, so I'll skip tracks and go to Tycho then, who who observed a, a supernova, which you now call Tycho supernova, um, but was a new star. Literally, the the sky changed. A star, a new star appeared, and then it disappeared. That shouldn't happen. That's not. Aristotelian. That's not why. That's that's not the way it should be. Um, but it is, uh, and that that meticulous record keeping, and then really, I think, and maybe this is mirrored in the music too. I, I'm, I'll say again, I'm not a musician, so I don't want to like talk. I don't really want to get too much wrong about. Well, that's this. what we're here for. Uh, right? Yeah. That's <laughs> so. So someone mentioned that was the the Huygens data sounded like um, like synth music and. Um, and you were saying then, then there was a huge shift, there was a shift or a change to more discordant music then in the yeah. 17, 1800s or? Seven, yeah, in the 17th century. So basically right it's around the same time as, you know, Kepler, Galileo, um, where, you know, as their ideas are starting to get out there, you have in music. So the, like the last pieces that we did, the Monteverdi and the Strozzi, and we talk a little bit about the Seconda Pratica and it's about like the music following the text and bringing out the emotions and that kind of thing and so you have really stark contrast in the music you have a lot of dissonance to kind of express the sort of darker painful side of things whereas you might have more consonants to express the you know more beautiful side of things but for the baroque it was really important to have both whereas like if you look before that 
they weren't as interested in, you know, in the darker side, let's say. <laughs> um, and, and so I don't know, is that, do you, you disagree with me there, Phil? Uh, no, no, I think that that's, uh, that's very true. I think that there's even more down to earth connections. For instance, somebody, I think it was, let me go back up in the chat and see uh, that um, uh, Sarah Davies mentioned that Galileo's father, Vincenzo, was a musician. He made his living as a musician. He also was part of a, a, an intellectual group that got together and started to discuss the very basic idea of moving from the Renaissance sound of many equal voices to the Baroque sound of a very clearly understood voice and accompaniment. And this is Galileo's father. Galileo himself was a very good lutenist. And his brother Michelinolo, it's not actually Michelangelo, but it's Michelinolo. I don't know why that is. He was a famous composer, uh, lutenist who worked in Austria, published a book of incredibly early, incredible early Baroque music. And um, and and I think he was supported by Galileo. I mean, he was the he was the itinerant brother musician, like all of us musicians who needed to have monetary support. <laughs> Galileo supported his brother, so there's that connection uh, just right there. And the other thing too, really quickly, is that musical instruments uh, were considered to be min minor, small representations of this large universe, this large planetary motion. And as planets could affect pestilence and could affect your mood, the instrument was a small little instrument to do the same thing. You would vibrate strings and the strings, it's, it's ironic when you pluck a string on a lute, the, the talent is to be able to pluck it so that when the two strings get struck, they move in perfect circles. And the more perfect the circle, the better the tone of the instrument. And so in a strange way, orbiting is involved in the actual making of music, which at the time, with very little sophisticated uh, architecture, um, these strings moving were like magic. And they were like, uh, they were like something out from the outer world, you know, from that, from the universe. Out there. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, in a way, Galileo's brother kind of maybe helped facilitate the invention of the telescope, right? Because as I understand it, Galileo was needed to raise money for the family. And so he started selling telescopes and kind of pushing that more. And so it may be that, that impoverished musicians actually, you know, have a place in advancing science, right? <laughs> Everything was intermixed. I mean, the, the uh, musicians were considered, uh, music was considered to be a science as well as an art. And you see pictures of people measuring, um, like you'll see a loop like this and it'll be on a table with lines going out from it as they figure out what the proper way is to dissect the neck with frets to make the right proportions in the sound and make music happen in a western scale yeah and somebody asked and i might as well just say this real quick uh first of all this instrument i'm playing i played in the uh video it's called the Bejuela de Mano, the vial of the hand in Spanish. And it is the Spanish version of the Renaissance lute. And this oh, the sound hole, somebody asked, why is the sound hole blocked? And it actually isn't blocked. It's got holes in it. It's a parchment with a bunch of little tiny holes. And, and, and any pluck string instrument needs to have an open spot on the face so that the top can vibrate correctly. So that's, that's the reason for it. And it's called a, a rose. Wondering if we might be able to talk about some of the other instruments too, because there have been a lot of lot of questions, and I believe Bruce that there have been lots of questions. The, the the big instrument in the back. So would you talk a little bit about about the instruments that that you played in the concert this uh, evening? There were actually three instruments in the back. I don't want to leave out that white table that some <laughs> wondered about that was used in the last number. That is actually called a white table. That <laughs> Actually, work quite well, and any good percussionist is happy to use anything they can hit that sounds good. They'll use it, and we needed a drum, and there it was in the Baroque room, and so that's the white table drum. Uh, then, on to, the, to your right is a pipe organ. It's a tracker action where the keys are connected directly to the valves that open the air into the pipe. The the, the pipe organ was actually the very early first keyboard instrument ever invented, and 
That's a lovely instrument that lives in the Baroque room that was originally available as a kit instrument. Um, if you listen to the intermission, that was this pipe organ right here that was built by a builder in the Netherlands, very similar to that instrument in the Baroque room in many ways. Um, but then the other instrument you're asking about with the big lid, well, when I was a kid, I was fascinated by the pipe organ. And of course, you think of the pipe organ, you think of the works of J.S. Bach. I also knew that some popular, a popular work of J.S. Bach was the Goldberg Variations, which everybody knows Glenn Gould played on the piano. So I thought, oh, Bach must have written it for the piano, because that's what Glenn Gould is playing it on. Well, actually, the piano hadn't been invented yet. Uh, the piano wasn't invented towards the end of Bach's life, and at that time, it was kind of early and not working very well. Um, the popular keyboard instrument when you weren't at the big pipe organ in the church was the harpsichord. And this is actually an instrument much closer to Phil's um, lute than the piano because it plucks the strings when you press the key, a little piece of an uh, uh, authentic instrument, a little piece of wood rises up, a little some crow's quill sticking out, it catches the string and eventually the string falls off and plays the note. Um, just add one more thing, like a pipe organ, to get variety, this lovely instrument available in the Baroque room, it's a fabulous instrument. I was very honored to be able to make use of it. It has two keyboards. And the upper keyboard, you might have seen me move my hands back and forth. When I went up, I got a little bit softer and gentler. And so because the harpsichord, you can't adjust. When you press harder, it doesn't pluck harder. Phil has complete control of that on his instruments. But on the harpsichord, when you press the key, it just plucks the string. And so having two keyboards gives that variety. But if you if you listen, I had a, a lot of fun with the Luli, where you can do things on a harpsichord you can't do on a piano, where you can do all sorts of rolls and articulation and little trills and color to add spice to the music. That's what's the joy of the harpsichord. Awesome. Related to this conversation, we have um, a young person in the audience named Archer who is six years old and wants to know how many instruments do each of you play? Because you you, you were just talking about three for this performance alone. So uh, why don't we go around the room? How many, how many instruments do you play? Joe, we haven't heard from you yet. <laughs> well, I play three instruments. <clears throat> uh, assuming you, you distinguish between the Baroque violin and the modern violin. And they, they are significantly different instruments in many ways, even though the fingerings are all the same. And then I also play the viola. And I'm about to take up an instrument called the lira di braccio, which is a, uh, a fascinating instrument. It's very similar to the VL that uh, you saw Jenna Watson play in this performance, except that it has two additional strings that are used as drones. So they're just played constantly as you play with the other strings. So uh, that'll be a fun thing to start to learn. Who's next? Yana, is your voice your instrument or do you also <laughs> play an instrument? Well, my voice is my instrument. And similar to the violin, I could say that I have a modern voice and a Baroque voice <laughs> to some extent, uh, somewhat different techniques. And, and then I also do play keyboard. So uh, I studied piano, but I can apply those same skills to harpsichord somewhat uh, amateurishly, let's say. <laughs> Bruce, uh, more than, I'm assuming more than three. Looks like you've got something in your hands. I got the harpsichord, the organ, and the white table. Uh, I occasionally play the, the piano. That would maybe be like Yana. It's not my premier instrument. But I every week get together with friends and play a whole family of recorders, well, one at a time. And I'll segue to another one of the wonderful questions. I thank, you, thank the audience. What do I like about this music? I'd say when I play the old music, it is so interestingly different from what we know as music today. It, I, it helps to put me back. What was it like at that time? And for me, what is special about a lot of it is based on folk music and on dancing. And so it has a very earthy rhythmic quality that is of the people. And that that is what I love about Renaissance and medieval music. Yeah, I think it's really important to stress how important dance was for this music. I mean, so many of the forms were based on, on dance and uh, and it's not an instrument, but but Joe and I have actually been trying to learn Baroque dance for that very reason, to try to understand better the, the dance rhythms behind 
the music that we play. So that's also a great point, Bruce. Bill, we got we can't leave you out. How many instruments do oh. you play? Well, it depends. I'm a little bit like Joe. I have uh, 12 lutes, uh, each one for a different period of music from medieval up through late Baroque. And some of them are used when playing with orchestras. Uh, I've often will play continual with orchestras and they're big, long. Well, I have one here. I could kind of show you. Uh, this is one I played on the recording and um, it, ha it has extra strings on it. And that's because the the big rule of music is always louder, faster, and uh, and bigger in scope. And so over time, they kept adding strings to the lute to give it more and more uh, depth. And so, so you have to have the appropriate instrument for all the music periods you play. But I also I studied classical guitar. Uh, and actually, when I was at North Carolina School of the Arts, I realized I was going into the lute. And so I, I did my recital on the guitar, but I did all lute music, <laughs> all lute music in my recital. And then when I got finished, I started playing lute exclusively. But I still do play some guitar. Ted, well, I, don't too bad. I was gonna say, oh, go ahead. Uh, it's too bad that Jenna Watson isn't here because she may really trump all of us in the yeah. instruments that she plays. So do, you, do you guys know what else she plays? Harp. She plays the harp, the viol, the yeah. back violin, the Baroque violin, the viola. Um, I think I'm missing. Pretty She's pretty, pretty mean Hurdy card Gurdy. player. Pretty mean card. Oh yeah, hurdy gurdy. And card player too, I know. <laughs> you know, I can't yeah. let you go. I love this question. Um, is the piano compared to, comparable to a dulcimer? And I never thought it's, but it, the early piano sounds a lot like a hammer dulcimer. It has harder hammers. It has a very delicate sound. And so the answer is yes. Tad, I don't want you to feel left out. Do you do you play any instruments? Do you want to do it now you're in the company of some very talented yeah. people here? I, yeah. play, I, I play Spotify. That's, <laughs> that's my main thing. Um, and I guess I'll, I'll, count, I'll count my voice as that, actually, because I, I, I sing along. Not, not well, not in public, but I do sing along to it, so. There you go. Yeah. I, there was a really interesting question that came in about non-Western music from the Middle Ages and Renaissance era from cultures that used very different scales. Was such music also likened to astronomical phenomena and math as well? That's a good that question. That is a really good question. And <laughs> unfortunately, I'm not, I, I have some background in musicology, but not ethnomusicology. Um, they they were they were very concerned with the time of day and are with the time of day that you play particular uh, ragas and yes and certainly yeah. the music is constructed differently in the sense that it's usually there's a an somewhat improvised uh, they, they don't like play uh, written out melodies that are completely written out there's an improvised quality and there are certain gestures that you play. Um, the harmonic part of it is more more of a drone support, although there's all sorts of kinds of accompaniment. So I, I kind of think that Western music has been a little bit more concerned with the relationships of intervals uh, and harmony, you know, based on the twelve tone Western system, which you know is is our we don't have any quarter tones in our scale like they do in in Middle Eastern and uh, in Indian music, so. It's a different, but you know, who knows? Probably somebody knows better than I do. Yeah, I, mean, I think if you look at Indian music, that there's um, a lot of the kind of order that that you like you rightly say goes more into the harmonic structure of Western music is maybe seen more in the rhythmic structure of say Indian music, where the tala are very rigidly kept. The, the tala being a particular sort of musical uh, a rhythmic framework in a piece are kept pretty rigidly through any particular piece and express certain uh, ratios, let's say. That was great, thank you. I'm just, I'm taking a look through, um, well, there's a, a another question about, I think we've talked about this a little bit, but maybe we'll come back to it. Did the controversy between geocentrism and heliocentrism affect music at the time or was it represented at all? Well, I, I think that to, oh, go ahead, Ted. 
I was oh, saying, Tom, why don't you, you jump in first? I think I sort of answered that. I mean, just to refer back to that, I mean, I think the, it's not so much explicitly that Geo versus Helio controversy, but um, Kepler's work to try to find, to try to match the motions of planets to a scale. Um, he was also trying, I think from what I remember, trying to match uh, geometric forms as well to, to music, um, but I, I, I'm not well versed in that. Um, so in a sense, it, the music was affecting, or astronomy was affecting music and vice versa, um, but maybe not so much the explicit debate between geo and helio systems. But yeah, I think right. it, it, it kind of, it's emblematic of like the changing philosophies that, you know, geo, the geocentric model is much more about kind of this pure balanced, you know, anthro, for more anthrocentric world, um, which fits with the same kind of ideals that you saw in music about, you know, kind of a pure purity to sonority that then as we go to the heliocentric model and we start seeing, um, you know, a universe that's much more complex, we also have music that's becoming more dissonant, more asymmetrical. Um, and, and so it's more like that there's a background in, in the philosophy that's the same. And I think it's kind of interesting to speculate on, you know, was there an influence either direction in that respect? I mean, a lot of these people were in, uh, you know, cultural circles like academia that were coming together and talking about music and art and painting and astronomy and science and all sorts of things. And, and they're all sharing these ideas. So it, it seems very likely that there's a lot of influence. Sylvia has both a comment and a question. First of all, she says, ciao. Uh, she was lucky to have spent a considerable time in Florence, Italy and to have walked the Arno River and stood on Galileo's doorstep where she believes um, he was sequestered by the Pope for his iconoclastic beliefs that challenged the church at the time. She'd love to hear from each musician vocalist about your love of music from earlier periods and its relevance to life in our 21st century. It's a big question. <laughs> well, I guess the um, one thing that's true is when you start to get into the music from these periods in the past, you realize that the whole emotional gamut is present as well. It's not like it's not like people were learning how to express themselves. And the more you work with the music, I mean, the reason I love the music is I love the acoustic, gentle. It's I always think of, of early music as being like a wise person who doesn't yell. And it's just it's just very beautiful and and in intertwining and it, it isn't always beautiful but it's uh and then when you start listening to it and start playing it you start to realize like we hear uh, there'll be a melody in a piece a sub melody that actually is quoting another piece of music from the same time uh but you you don't know that because we most people don't know that because we're we're not in that repertory as deeply as those of us who play it and get to know it and uh so to me, that's one of the reasons I, I love it so much. I think it's just a, a fully formed art form. Yeah, I guess for me, one of the things that I like about early music is that there is a lot more freedom, you know, coming from more of a standard classical training. Um, you know, you kind of learn that there are the notes on the page and there are the instructions given and you just have to follow that and there are certain ways that it should be done and uh when you get to early music nobody really knows you know i mean we know a lot of things we know general rules we have treatises that tell us like this was ornamentation that should be used and this is the style you know that you might want to use because so and so wrote a treatise criticizing somebody for using the wrong style so maybe you find out you know what a what the people are doing that's considered wrong and what the people think it should be right so so you get a general idea of what it should be but when it comes to the actual piece of music you have really very little information the composer is not standing there saying you know do this and this and this and this for the most part uh and, until you get later in the baroque maybe and and so there's just a lot of freedom to bring your own interpretation to the music, to explore it, to try to figure out, you know, to unlock a piece and figure out what's going on, what's the core essence of that piece. Uh, 
Other, do you want to comment? Um, I mean, for me, a big part of it is the the quiet intensity of the music, um, the ability to really drive home a point and make something really meaningful and emotional, but always within this very soft, careful environment. It's it uh, careful isn't the right word, but it's it's so much quieter than what most of the music you might hear. You know, if you go to a symphony, if you go to a rock concert, if you walk down the street, uh, just the noise of traffic and the noise of construction and how that kind of overwhelms you. And this early music gives you an opportunity to really focus and listen to just uh, a much gentler sound that still carries this great quantity of emotion. Uh, and I really find that enjoyable. Kind of like what Tad was talking about with going back in time to Italy and, you know, reducing the light pollution and Indeed. suddenly like, you know, your senses become much more aware of the, the universe around you. Certainly, I remember during recording where, you know, we were had just finished a take and I think a, a, a truck came by to pick up garbage outside the recording space and we we're like, well, glad we're done. <laughs> I guess one thing that I was thinking about, I had talked about this earlier, but my love of the medieval is that when I was privileged to get to Italy and realize just how close it is to Greece and Turkey, you know, those are very different countries we think of today and, and back. And yet at the medieval, there was a lot of trading going on in styles. And so when you hear medieval music, you hear, I think, a broader representation of that continent than later eras when it was all about what was happening in Rome and Florence and Paris. And the Parisians were fighting it out with the Italians, who's got the best style, and they weren't paying much attention to what was happening further east. So I, I like that really raw flavor that's very cosmopolitan. And one of the instruments we were using in, the, uh, um, in one of the medieval pieces the Rebecca, which Jenna was playing, uh, held low on her chest, the kind of small belly, uh, is an instrument that was actually very popular in Arab classical music of the period. Um, it was heavily used in uh, Morocco and in ver various Arabic cultures for their uh, music at the time. Though it was also used in medieval Europe as a traveling instrument because it was so small and portable and dancing masters could carry it around easily as could troubadours, jongleurs, just kind of pull it out of their bag. I hear Tad has a question. Tad, do you have the question? As we, because we are, I'm being mindful of the time. So we're, we are quickly approaching nine, nine o'clock. So maybe Tad, you, you get the last question of, of the evening tonight. Okay, um, this is uh, sort of a last minute one. I, I just shared my screen again and I brought up a, uh, a constellation. So it's summer, uh, we've got a set of constellations. We always talk about in the summer, they form the summer triangle. Uh, this is one of the main ones. It, it contains the star Vega uh, in the in the upper right. It's, it's a very important star in astronomy, starred in the movie Contact as well. Um, what I'm curious about though, uh, is how do you pronounce this name? Don't give away what it is. I'm just curious. I'll, I'll bring that up. I'll show that later. How do you pronounce this name? Because I've heard it a few different ways. Well, I think we would say Lyra. You say Lyra? Yeah, Lyra. And there is, in fact, a Baroque ensemble in, in the Twin Cities called Lyra Baroque, as it happens. And they say Lyra. OK. I've also heard, I should say, I've also heard Lyra then, too. Yeah. That's, yeah. That also seems fair. No one's going to get mad at me if I use either one. No. Okay. No, that's fine. <laughs> uh, for those at home wondering, uh, what is this? Anyone want to, as it comes up? Looks like we've got an answer. Well, we would call that a liar. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So now I know how to officially pronounce this then for, yeah. for planet planet shows. This uh, is as, a, as an instrument, it's a liar. <laughs> uh, but. And yeah. there was a very important question that just came in. Is this a lot like jazz? And we would all nod and say, 
it is a lot like modern jazz. Very much so. Definitely. So, so get technically Mike answer. gets the final question. Here we go. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Awesome. Well, thank you all. Thank you, Yana. Thank you, Joe, Bruce, Phil, Tad, for a fantastic performance and presentation um, this evening, as well as a fascinating converse conversation. I encourage everyone who's watching to keep an eye on the Bell Museum's event calendar and sign up for a mailing list to learn more about upcoming events. Similarly, you can sign up to receive updates from Suspiri about upcoming performances and other news on their website, suspiri.org, which we'll, we'll, we've put in the chat a few, a few times. We'd like to thank again the Metropolitan Regional Arts Council and the Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund for supporting Suspiri's work for this project. Thank you everyone for joining us. Take care and good night. <laughs>